So often, we refer to gold as a store of wealth. What does that mean exactly? And in the context of modern usage, how does it apply to you? The answer to this question is the root of why people buy gold and why it remains a popular investment today. Hello, and welcome back to another episode. Before we begin, please take a moment to like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you. The world is often full of contradictions. When you're a kid learning to drive, your parents tell you to keep both hands on the wheel while you watch them cruise down the freeway answering the phone. We encourage others to eat healthy, but end up at a drive through ourselves. And my all-time favorite, we refer to gasoline as gas, even though it is clearly a liquid. Gold has some contradictions to answer for itself, and one of those is its reputation as a store of wealth. How can we say this is a store of wealth when the price of gold rises and falls with greater volatility than the dollar? Well, gold's title as a store of wealth and a hedge is well-earned throughout history, but difficult to explain or quantify if you're not a historian. We're going to attempt to do just that today. So the next time you're struggling to explain to friends or family just why you're buying gold, you'll have the perfect response. Now we're going to tell a tale of gold and hyperinflation and its role during the period between World War I and World War II when the Weimar Republic in Germany presided over a period of hyperinflation. Now World War I had just ended. Germany took the blame as the losers, as the war guilt clause in the Treaty of Versailles named them and their allies culpable. Now the consequences of being named a guilty party and forced to re pay reparations is ultimately what led to hyperinflation. And it is the exchange rate between German marks and the US dollar that will give us a perfect benchmark to compare gold to. You see, the Weimar Republic mismanaged their economy and the reparations they were forced to repay. At to pay back other countries for the war, the Weimar Republic simply printed money. And they printed as much of it as they needed to or wanted to. So prior to the war, you could exchange four marks for a U.S. dollar. By 1920, it was 69 marks to one U.S. dollar. And the Weimar Republic continued printing money. They printed and printed and printed. By 1922, the government was printing million mark notes. And by 1923, one U.S. dollar was equal to one billion marks. People would bring wheelbarrows full of these worthless paper marks to the bakery to buy a loaf of bread. Children would stack them like bricks, playing with them in the mud and the streets. They literally had less value than toilet paper. The stories coming from Germany at this point were unreal. It's difficult to imagine, but foreigners would walk into town with a single US dollar and go out on the town for a night and have money left over when morning came. Speculators were shorting the German mark like crazy. You had students coming into Germany and purchasing rows of houses with allowance money that their parents gave them. Hyperinflation caused all kinds of chaos. Now, some Germans did well for themselves because of it. They did very well if they were producing or manufacturing things whose inputs came from Germany, if they were then exporting it and selling in other countries and receiving foreign currency that had value. But a lot of people struggled to survive during this time and it's ultimately the economic chaos that gave rise to extremism as people sought more and more extreme methods of recovery. And eventually this environment made way for Hitler to rise to power. Now, how does this relate to gold? Well, in this particular economy, people turned to barter. But for those who stored their wealth in gold, gold still had its value and was used as a currency. The German marks are worthless, and, and this is because the Weimar Republic had taken Germany off the gold standard to finance the war, and it's what enabled them to print money without limit. Gold could be used for barter or as currency, which some people did, or it could be converted into a foreign currency that still had value. In the year 1923, an ounce of gold was worth about 20 to 21 US dollars. Those who held precious metals were okay. Gold was the ultimate hedge and the ultimate store of value. And this story from 1920s Germany shows us that regardless of what is going on, you will always be able to use gold as a means of trade and security. 
It's why gold is considered a store of value. It's why it's considered a hedge against government spending and inflation. It is these examples of hyperinflation where gold and silver really shine. Now, if you think hyperinflation is an isolated incident relegated to dusty history books, crack open a book or a web browser and learn about Zimbabwe, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Greece, Argentina, Iran, Sudan, Yemen, and Venezuela. Even now, news reports of food inflation reaching 30% month over month are trickling in from countries around the world. Now, at the root of hyperinflation is Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law may best be described as an observation rather than a law. It says that bad money will push out good money. Governments start taking precious metals out of money, at first by reducing purity, and then doing away with it altogether. And this gives governments the freedom to create whatever fiscal policy they prefer to benefit themselves or their countries. In today's world, there are zero countries remaining on the gold standard. Switzerland is often cited as the last country to leave the gold standard back in 1999. Ever since we left the gold standard, there has been enormous concern from supporters of the gold standard that we would eventually print ourselves into a hyperinflation environment. And as the money supply has increased following the Bretton Woods Agreement, we have seen an increase in the price of gold. Now remember that gold technically is not increasing in price. The value of gold has always remained the same. If you went out in 1940, an ounce of gold gets you a nice suit. And today, an ounce of gold can get you that as well. But if you spend dollars, you would have paid something like 40 to 45 dollars for a nice suit in 1940. You can barely buy a shirt for 40 dollars in the US today, let alone a full suit. So it's not that gold is increasing value, but rather that the value of a dollar continues to decline. Now, of course, gold is traded on dollars and it's traded in a free market, so there are going to be price swings and volatility. But when someone buys gold, they're doing it with the understanding that it is a long play meant to be a hedge against government mismanagement, hyperinflation, and currency collapse. While any of those things may cause investments to nominate in dollars to drop, gold should remain robust in retaining its value. In other words, it functions as a store of wealth. It's also used in other ways, such as collateral for a loan or an investment that appreciates in dollar-denominated value, but remember that its primary purpose can best be understood through the lens of history. So when we see potential cracks in the system that might lead to currency collapse, it spurs precious metal purchases. That's why gold is suddenly purchased when a war breaks out. That's why we had a spectacular increase in demand for metals when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed and precipitated a series of bank runs and bank failures. The wealthy and the investor class have learned the lessons of history and understand that gold and silver are the ultimate hedge. And luckily, with the help of the internet, it's never been easier for you to secure your own future in the same manner with reliable investments you can hold in the palm of your hand. That's all we have for you today. Please remember to like, subscribe, share with a friend. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.